Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hadi, and I am your panelist for today. Now, we're literally going to just give it two more minutes whilst people jump on. And apologies for the delayed start, slight technical difficulties, but we are here. And today's format is really going to be in a Q&A type style. And I've got branding specialist QB Springer with me. QB, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon to you. Hi, Hadi. Hi, QB. And as you might have read from the marketing, QB is a world famous branding specialist and she has over 25 years experience. QB's worked with the world's top brands, including Nike, L'Oreal, Blackberry, MTV, the Mobo Awards, and just a list of so many. She's worked with Justin Timberlake, World's Worst Motor Cars, Aston Martin, Facebook, TikTok. QB, is there anybody that you haven't worked with? <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, there are. There are plenty of people that I haven't worked with, but I think the ones that I'm really proud of are some of the ones that you've listed there. Um, yeah, but there's still more. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to kick off and go straight into the questions. Now, Kiwi, you started as an intern with P. Diddy or Sean Puff Daddy Coombs, as some know him, in New York. Can you explain a bit about how that opportunity came about and how old you were? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been, as you mentioned, in brand marketing for the last 25 years. Um, the beginning of my career was two really important internships. And I'm, I'm an advocate for internships. The first one was actually when I was 18 years old, still at university with MTV Europe. And that came about through an assignment that was required at university. I ended up meeting a, a contact and, and they opened that door. Uh, what was really interesting with that, and I, I say, to this to people all the time that perse perseverance um, often time outdoes pure talent and I knocked on their door for a, a good part of a year before I even got my first interview um, speaking or trying to speak to Trevor Nelson at the time as a celebrity DJ for MTV and doing a program called MTV Lick. Um, off the back of MTV once I had finished my degree, so I was probably about 22, um, I managed to cure, secure something called Mountbatten. Uh, Mountbatten was set up by Lord Mountbatten. It's an internship program for people from the UK to be able to go to New York. Uh, they've subsequently opened the um, entry points. You can go to New York now, you can go to Singapore, you can go to Hong Kong, um, and you can go to Sydney and vice versa, they can come to us. And so I had the opportunity to be part of Mountbatten a one-year internship program uh, in New York City. And whilst I was at New York, in New York rather, uh, I met another intern from the UK who was working for Diddy's um, record company, Bad Boy Records at the time. And she introduced me to Puff and um, they let me know they had a marketing agency. And that's how I got the internship at his marketing agency called Blue Flame. That must have been amazing. I mean, there's so much to be said for young adult interns. Um, internships are often seen as being something that you do when you're 16. Can you talk a bit about just adult internships and the benefits? I think it's important um, for young adults uh, who are either finishing off their degree, whether they're undergrad or their master's, um, so oftentimes organizations are looking for that bit of experience and, and, you know, I get my young mentees ask me all the time, how do I get the experience, how do I get the job if I don't have the experience? And so I always advocate internships. However, um, I think that organizations need to be much more responsible with the way that they do internships, particularly in the creative sector. I was very lucky in that I worked for bosses who valued nurturing young talent as opposed to just making cups of tea for a couple of years. Um, and so I really got a, a robust experience, you know, working at Blue Flame was a small marketing agency in, in New York at the time, it was very much a boutique agency, um, working with brands like Coca-Cola and, and um, urban brands like Jean John Clothing Line. And so I managed to be part of, you know, quite an integrated team and was, 
as a result, was able to uh, participate in the launch of Sean John Clover Line on Fifth Avenue. And that was such an eye opener for me. Um, so I think organizations, I think it's imperative for them to have internship programs, but I think they need to be robust internship programs, one that allow young people to get a range of experience across the organization, across departments, um, so they can work out where they fit in with their gifts and their talents. Amazing answer. Now, Kubi, out of all of the things in the world <laughs> that you could have done, what made you decide to niche down to branding? Why yes. branding? Yeah, that's such a good question. I didn't really decide to. Uh, the truth is, is that my backstory is that I used to be a dancer. Uh, I danced for the Spice Girls, believe it or not, when I was 17, their first European tour. Uh, but I injured my knee on tour. And so I loved the, in the entertainment industry. And it was really, I fell into branding. Um, doing the internship at MTV, I got to see what it was about. I loved it. I liked it. Um, I continued to study my degree in marketing and then major uh, so my degree in business and then majored in, um, in marketing. And then when I got out to New York City, the niche happened because of Diddy. You know, he's the mastermind of personal brands. He's constantly reinventing himself. I mean, at one point he was Puffy, then he was P. Diddy and he was Sean Diddy Combs. I mean, now I saw the other day his brother Love, right? Um, you know, he's a multi- million dollar personal brand and it was working underneath him that really got me to see marketing through the lens of branding as opposed to product development um, or product marketing and I just loved what it what it was about uh, and then off the back of working with Diddy I managed to get a contract working with Justin Timberlake um, I always pause when I say this and say to all the women that are listening Justin is fine <laughs> Okay, he's fine. <laughs> just pause for the cause. Just to add that little bit of news in there. He's a wonderful human being, both inside and out. Um, I'm working with him on his um, Justified tour. You know, again, he was a personal brand. And then that led to me working with Mariah Carey. She's a personal brand. That led to me working... Uh, with Sex in the City, very specifically with Sarah Jessica Parker, another phenomenal personal brand that led me to working with Rio Ferdinand, the footballer. So it kind of happened by default. And then when I was 29 and working with Beyonce and L'Oreal, I suppose that was kind of the pinnacle of personal brands that I was working with, um, looking at how they commercialize their brand. So I fell into it, if the truth be known. So interesting. I loved how you paused for the call. Justin Timberlake is so fine. <laughs> yes. A lot of people might be wondering, what is personal branding and what are the key components of a personal brand? I know that there's a lot of misconception about personal branding. People, some people think you have to put everything out there, you know, all the time. Can you demystify it for us a bit and just list the five key components of yeah. a personal brand. Absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing that I often say to people is um, when, when the idea of branding came around and personal branding came around, uh, we all really assumed it was for the celebrities. And, and that's very much how my career started, right? The kind of working with these really big celebrity names. Um, over the last 10 years, however, I've been pulling the lessons that I learned working with celebrities on how they built powerhouse um, and power and influence and kind of try to analyze that as real strategic steps that the everyday person could take within the workplace. How do we gain power and influence within the workplace? And I would say ultimately, that's what personal branding is. Um, it is not about how many blog posts you put out or, you know, how many times you update your LinkedIn profile or, you know, how amazing your clubhouse room is. It's not about being able to do the 60 second elevator pitch, even though, you know, those of us who are old enough will remember people telling us that. Those, those things are, are necessary tools to understand and to utilize, but in and of themselves, it is not a personal brand. A personal brand really is about power and influence. It's about service-based leadership. It's about how do I support my group, my community, my organization, my department, my customers, my tribe? How do I be of service to them? And in return of being of service to them, they then trust me. And then when they trust me, they buy into me. Um, and, and one of the ways, uh, as a practical example of that, people often say to me, Kubi, I hate networking. 
And the reason why they hate networking is because they think that networking is going into a room and talking about themselves. Hi, my name's Kubi and I'm a brand specialist and this is what I've done. And that's not what networking should be about. Networking should be about going into the room and identifying who do you want to listen to and then support. So what does that look like? It means you go into a room and you say, hi, my name's Kubi. Who are you? What do you do? Wow, that's amazing. Tell me more. How can I help you? Oh, there might be somebody I can connect you with that I know in my network. That's real networking is listening to the person who's in front of you and being of service to them and being the person who connects the dots for them and supports them and acts as a bridge to their career and their development. And when you look at personal branding through those lens, through service-based leadership or servant-based leadership, then it takes the pressure of you feeling like you always have to promote what you're doing and, you know, act like a bit of a narcissist. It's really not about that at all. I love that word. It's a word that we don't hear used that often. Service. Mm. Service. It's about what you can do for others as opposed to what others can do for you. Yeah, and, and the basic principle in life is givers gain. So even if we take this, let's say you're in a, a department and you're thinking, you know, my boss is driving me bonkers, um, you know, the pressure too much during this kind of post-pandemic and I want to leave. Well, leaving could be one thing you could do, but another thing or another way you could look at it in terms of how your personal brand is developed is to actually say to yourself, how can my brand support my boss by identifying who in my network makes our job easier. So it might be that your boss is under pressure because they've got KPIs to deliver on, they're putting that pressure underneath you, rather than saying, oh, he's an idiot or she's an idiot, that's it, I'm out of here. Personal branding is much more about saying, actually, how can I be the connector in the room? How can I use my gifts and talents to support those who are under pressure, who are within my immediate community? And when you do that, then people remember you and then people say oh actually when I need somebody that can really go over and above or can deliver or can think outside the box you're the person to go to um, and it's about bringing that thought leadership to any environment that you're in so that's personal branding. Amazing you actually went on to answer the next question that I had which was how does this look in the workplace now, as an individual, a lot of people are still working from home and we may or may not be going back down to another lockdown. That waits to be seen. How can you stand out as a personal brand whilst we are still working from home? That's a really, really good question. I, I would say to people, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's important now more than ever to build out your relationships within the workplace. Um, as an example, the very first, sorry, excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. I'm back, do apologize. <laughs> um, when the first lockdown happened, one of the things that I said to um, the clients that I was working with is, can you put some time aside every single week? And for some people, it was a few hours on a Friday afternoon where you start to, we, we called it kind of, you know, uh, coffee and catch up, where you'd have a virtual coffee and catch up or, you know, a virtual hangout with those who are in your team. That's not about just the deliverables, but about working out how people are feeling and how you might be able to support them. And a lot, of the, um, <clears throat> a lot of the people who I working with during the first lockdown found that that did a number of things. One, it allowed them to meet new team members. So there were some organizations where, you know, the organization's so big that actually all they really knew before the lockdown was their immediate operational teams. But when the lockdown happened, they were able to reach out to offices that were in international markets, to reach out to maybe people who were working in the same discipline, but maybe in, in different offices across the UK, or who people were working in disciplines that supported their day-to-day -day job and their discipline supported them. And so it was really a, an ideal opportunity to say let me get away from just how I'm feeling but let me use this as an opportunity to reach out to those relationships that I even need to strengthen or those relationships that I need to build um, and a lot of the people who I've been working with during these crazy pandemic times has found that really dealing with relationship marketing has supported them personally but has also opened up new opportunities <clears throat> excuse me in their career which is um 
I would say would be one of the key things that we need to do. Don't be in isolation trying to work it out and develop yourself. Actually look at how can I build out my relationship marketing strategy. Amazing, amazing. Now, switching tone slightly, Kibi, you've got a new book called Crisis Made My Brand. And people often see crisis as being a bad thing, really. Why is it not necessarily a bad thing? Um, I think, well, I, I would say it like this. So I wrote the book because when the pandemic first hit, um, I saw so many people kind of running around like a headless chicken going, it's a crisis, it's a crisis, what do we do? And I kind of thought to myself, well, this isn't the first rodeo. If you've been in business long enough, we've all had crisis moments. Those of us that were in business during the 2008 uh, financial crisis, that was a massive crisis moment. You know, when I arrived in New York with my internship in uh, 2001 to work with Diddy, 9-11 happened. In fact, I saw the second tower hit. And so what I realized at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm a Christian and, and, and so I use uh, this language and I hope nobody doesn't mind, but kind of God spoke to me and said, this isn't your first rodeo. And let's write a book that really talks about how some of the best in the world in business have been able to really take crisis and turn it into their crossroad of opportunity. And instead of panicking the moment, have actually said, no, let's be much, much more strategic. Let's open our eyes a little bit more. Let's change our perspective perspective and let's see where is the opportunity here for us to be able to either do better or enhance our careers or birth a new business. So I'll give you some examples. You know, if you think about somebody like JK Rowling, you know, we all know the classic story, right? She was a writer. She couldn't get the Harry Potter first book signed. Um, she went to every single publisher until Bloomsbury, who was then a very small publishing house, agreed to do a strategic partnership with her. And it was in that partnership that she's been able to not only sell books and do well, but become the multi-million dollar author that we know her to be. Now, if we go back to that moment when she was writing the first book and couldn't get signed, she was technically in a crisis moment, but she said, actually, I'm gonna change my perspective. And rather than trying to continue to knock down the doors of the big publishing houses and get more rejection, how about I find a smaller publishing house and do a partnership with them? And, and so I think, you know, another example is Lego. Uh, Lego in the 2008 crisis, uh, the financial crisis, they found themselves in a real predicament saying, how do we navigate this? And so they said, OK, what we need to do is we need to consolidate. We need to stop doing all of the um, extension projects they were doing. I think it was something like 7,000 odd different product categories that they had. And they narrowed it down to just under 2,000 product categories. And they focused on niching down to their core strength. And once they niched down onto their core strength, they got back to what they did best. And in doing that, they were able to diversify their distribution strategy, but actually be known once again for what they did really, really well. And so that's a classic example where I would say to people in your crisis, Stop doing everything and go back to your core strength. What do people know you do for and do that really, really well and narrow down and niche down on that? So, yeah, if we change our perspective, uh, the book is all about how we can then navigate these challenging times. Really interesting. Um, I would never have thought about, you know, the fact that you can turn crisis around for good. I know that you can sometimes come out at the other end of it. Sometimes you're a bit burnt. Sometimes you feel a bit scathed. But what are some of the personal crises that you've managed in the workplace and that you come out on top of? Mm. Um, so I, I'll, I'll never forget when... Um, I'll use this one as an example. I'll never forget when I was working with Aston Martin, um, we, as an agency, so I, I run a brand marketing agency now that, that's all about um, female brand marketing. So we work with really interesting clients that are trying to speak to that 24 trillion female economy globally. And so Aston Martin was a particular client and we had um, eight female designers that we were launching during London Fashion Week in partnership with Aston Martin and their Mayfair dealership. And we had a situation where originally uh, we were meant to have 16 designers from all over uh, the world, people from Dubai and Turkey, the UK, the Netherlands, Nigeria, et cetera, kind of really diverse um, 
uh, amazing eclectic female designers and we were meant to have 16 of them and due to various different uh, reasons um, quite a number of them weren't able to get visas and we were you know we were in panic moment as you would be right we'd created an entire show uh, with Aston Martin to celebrate the fact that they had their first female chairperson in a hundred years. We we're meant to have 16 female designers fly to England to do this campaign and this brand activation project. And uh, a large number of them couldn't come and, and we only had 12. In that moment, what I said to the creative team, what I said to the Aston Martin team, what I said to the events team is actually maybe what this does is it gives us an opportunity to use the time in the show to be able to showcase the brand and the product in a much better light. And we ended up kind of creatively redoing the show. And it turned out a thousand times better because we were, we were in a position where we could move the cars during the show. We could have models coming out of the cars. We could have really showcasing the product because of the time that was given. And so why do I say that this worked out as a good thing? And what is the lesson here? The lesson was we could have spent loads of time trying to work out how do we get these extra designers to come? How do we spend more money on visas? How do we, you know, flaff around with bureaucracy and paperwork and try and get these extra designers to come? And that would have just caused the entire team to be frustrated. And in, that actual, in actuality, instead of sticking to what it would have been business as usual, we want 16 designers, we need 16 designers by any means necessary. What we said is, let it go. And I think sometimes in business, we need to have the attitude of let it go. And let's be okay with it not being okay and do things differently. And it's oftentimes very hard when we've got processes and procedures and frameworks and strategies for people to say, it's okay to not be okay let it go. But there's magic in letting it go. And in that particular scenario, the magic came when we were able to say, let's be free and work with the 12 that we have and let's see what new things we can come up with. And honestly, our client was so much happier with the turnout because their product got featured in a better way. So the takeaway from this is be okay with it not being okay. And you're right, that completely goes against systems. It completely goes against strategies. It completely goes against processes. But ultimately, it can sometimes work out for the better. Absolutely, Hadi. And I think in this day and age, you know, anybody who's still writing a five-year business plan, um, you know, is odd. <laughs> to say the least because you know we don't really know what Boris is going to do tomorrow much less five years time so I think agility is needed when we're building our personal brand and you know I would say the best thing during these times is to be that person who is willing to raise their hand and say I'm okay with it not being okay I'm okay with throwing away what we thought it should be and thinking differently I'm the person that's reading outside of my industry reading the trade publications outside of my industry to get fresh ideas to bring into our teams, to bring into our organizations. I'm the person that's networking with people outside of my teams, outside of my organization to look at new ways of doing business. You know, if we think of even what, um, what's happening in technology with virtual reality. I'm saying to corporate clients, why are you not getting involved with, v with VR? Why are you not looking at AR in a much more robust way? Because that's the future. That's the new business as normal. And so, you know, if you've got a brick and mortar business that's still trying to do things as was, you know, you might be obsolete. You might end up like a, a blockbuster. And so I think in today's uh, today's workplace, the personal brands that will stand out are the ones that are okay with it not being okay. Stop panicking and be agile in your approach. And, and you'll find it's a lot happier way to work and a much easier way to work as well. I think Blockbuster is a classic example of evolve or die, basically. Yeah, and we've seen it with personal brands. We've seen the amount of people who um, have, you know, fallen off of seniority positions because of their lack of, of, of thinking outside of the box. And don't get me wrong, I think strategic thinking and critical thinking and analysing what's gone wrong is, is imperative, but that has to work in conjunction with a bit of agility. Absolutely. So what are the five steps that people can do if and when, but let me say when things go wrong in the workplace, because they will. What's the five steps, the five things that people can do when things do go wrong in the workplace? 
So I think the first thing is to, uh, number one, have a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset. And I talk about this in the book. Uh, for those that don't know the difference between the two, a growth mindset is comes from the idea, these are uh, psychology terms, right? And it comes from the idea that your a belief system is based out of you understanding that whilst you might have skills and abilities and gifts and talents, your responsibility is to constantly look at how you can develop those skills and talents because they're not fixed. Um, so for example, I have dyslexia. Uh, a fixed mindset would say you have dyslexia, you can't possibly write a book. A growth mindset is I have dyslexia, how do I find the tools and the resources to support me writing a book? So I think when things go wrong, you have to go inwardly first and analyze when it comes to this particular challenge, am I approaching it with a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? In other words, do I think it's doom and gloom full stop? Or am I willing to look at this and say, how can I use tools, resources, personal development to navigate this better? How can I find the solution? That's number one. Number two, again, going back to, to how you view the world is remembering that you always have a choice. And so in psychology, there's something called choice theory. And choice theory is the idea that whilst we can't control what happens externally, we have a choice in terms of how we respond to the external environment. So let's say for example, um, Boris puts us on lockdown and that means that once again, you're working remotely and you hated working remotely the first time round. Okay, so you're working remotely and you hate it. We get it, right? Boris has been a buffoon in your mind. We get it, that's external. But the choice theory comes to how do I choose to respond to this? How do I choose to adapt to this? How do I choose to make working from home much more enjoyable for me? So that's number two. So number one is about growth versus fixed mindset. Number two is about choice theory. Number three is about the relationships. And it's about saying, who do I need to have on this challenge with me to navigate the road easier? What mentors, associates, uh, coworkers, uh, support systems do I need to navigate this? And, and so often as human beings, because of fight or flight, with, with, with flight, we can go inwardly and we can go, I'm gonna go on my own on this journey. I'm gonna flee the situation. Where actually the better scenario would be, who do I bring on this journey with me to make it easier? And so a lot of the corporate clients that I'm working with, we're really looking at how do teams get that extra support when crisis hits? The fourth thing is recognizing that success is a journey, not a destination. And so don't be so fixed on what you thought the destination should be, but actually look at how can I take a new route to get to the ultimate destination. Be okay with saying, actually, I need to turn left and not turn right in this particular scenario. And then final thing I would say in terms of when crisis comes, and I talk about this in the book, um, I, 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 I refer to a story where my best friend um, four years ago passed away. And before uh, my best friend passed away, she had originally been given five years from the doctor that she was going to live. And she ended up living for 10 years. And I believe the reason why she had an extended period before she eventually went was because she said, I'm going to live even though it feels like I'm dying. And what does that mean? It means that even though a situation looks like it's out of your control, it might be that your finances look like they're um, depleting. It might look like the organization you're in looks like it's in chaos. It might mean that your personal situation looks like it is um, diminishing. Whatever that in inverted commas, dying looks like in, in that crisis moment, you have an opportunity to find the sprinkles of joy. And that's what my best friend did. She found the sprinkles of joy, even though she knew she had a limited time on this earth. And so I would really encourage everybody as we're navigating these challenging times personally, but also in business, find the sprinkles of joy. 
And that joy might be, I'm going to go for a walk. That joy might be that I'm going to, you know, enjoy writing a blog each week. Or that joy might be, I'm going to pick back up a journal. That joy might be, yes, I love my job and I'm building my personal brand. But in order to be at my optimum level, I'm going to do some yoga every single morning. Whatever that joy might be, find that sprinkle of joy. Because the reality is this. Whilst our personal brands and our business brands, you know, our person, sorry, are separate, our person affects our personal brand. So if you are not well, you will never be able to level up in the workplace. Amazing. And that's such an amazing point to end on. I mean, I could talk about this all day because you've dropped some really great nuggets. Um, if anybody has got any questions, now would be the time to answer, ask them because we'd like to open up the floor and just to ask Kubi just to take your questions. Anything that you've heard from today that, you know, has created a trail of thought, any questions that you've had from before the session started, please do ask them now. QB, as we're waiting for those questions to come in, is there anything else that you want to add just based on the conversation that we've had today so far? Yes, I think that uh, the other thing I would add in terms of building out your personal brand um, is consistency. I think one of the things that people find challenging, particularly around social media, is, is what do I post and, and how do I remain consistent? And I get that question all the time and so what I would say is sometimes when you don't know what to post it's okay to reshare so if you're on LinkedIn <clears throat> excuse me and you read an article and you think oh you know I've gleaned a lot from this article just reshare it reshare it and tag people who are in your tribe and in your LinkedIn community who you think would also glean from that article um, sometimes take the pressure off of you always feeling you have to create the content so that your personal brand is always seen as doing something and be okay with just curating the content and that does a number of things one it opens up your networks to the people who've created the content in the first place it allows you to reach out to them and say hi you know ex journalist ex-influencer, ex-business person, you know, I thought this article or this blog or this video that you put out or this podcast that you put out was really interesting. I've just shared it to my community. So it builds up your networks in curating content. That's number one. And number two, it allows you to be the person that people go to for really interesting information because you're you're putting out and resharing and being seen as somebody who is, you know, connecting the dots of information. And number three, what it does is it enhances your thought leadership. Because as you're, you're gleaning information from others and you're resharing it with your tribe, it actually allows you to then broaden your thinking, which then will probably stimulate you to be able to create fresh new content for yourself. Fab, fab, amazing stuff, Kubi. So we have a question. In fact, we have questions coming in now. Let me read the first one. So Gemma has asked, how much does a person's appearance play a part in their personal brand? And do you enhance it and use it? Or do you change it to meet the brand? Oh. That's a really good question. Do you change it to meet the brand? That's such a good question. Uh, I'll answer it by saying this. Um, I, I went and did a talk at um, Deloitte Bank uh, a few years back and it was really interesting because I was talking about personal branding and, and leadership and I was talking about showing up as your authentic self. And afterwards, quite a, a young um, employee, I, I put her in a, her mid twenties, came up to me and she said, quite angrily, she said, well, that's all well and good that you said to be authentic, but you know, I can't show up with me showing my tattoos because look where I work. And, and so I, I say, I always say to people, look at it like this. It's imperative for your personal brand's packaging to be authentically true to you within the framework of the organization that you have chosen to work for. And this is why I say you have chosen to work for, going back to this thing of choice theory. If you're in an organization that's culture and values doesn't align with your own brand values, then I would encourage you to start looking at your exit strategy. You know, we've only got a short bit of time on this earth. So why would you work in an environment where you can't show up as your true authentic self? 
within the framework of their values. So I say, I say like this to answer Gemma's question very specifically, your appearance should reflect your brand. And your brand, just to break it down, your personal brand is about your brand values, your brand mission, your brand vision, your brand personality, your brand story. All of those things come together to um, be bowled up in one key thing, which is your personal brand. And your external packaging, just like a corporate brand, should reflect your personal values. And then you've got to make sure it's within the framework of the organization you work in. And if you are so disbombobulated with the environment that you're in, I would encourage you to change the environment. Amazing answer. A really good example as well. Yeah. <laughs> and can I just, sorry, Hattie, can I just also add some meat to that? So uh, back in the day when I started, uh, my mother used to say to me, oh, Kubi, you know, to be taken seriously, you've got to wear a suit. You've got to wear, you know, a black suit and, and a gray suit. And, and I hate black and gray suits. I absolutely hate them because I love color. And um, I worked out as the years went on that my fashion sense was a little bit corporate rebel, right? That's kind of where I've coined it. I'm a bit of a corporate <laughs> rebel. <laughs> and so even when I go to environments where everybody else is wearing black and gray suits, I would choose instead to maybe wear a suit if it's a requirement of the environment, but mine might be a red suit. Right. Or if I notice that actually uh, the requirement might be, you know, a pencil skirt and a shirt, I might wear a leather pencil skirt with a white shirt. So I'm allowed to be my corporate rebel self, but within the framework of the environment that I'm going into. I hope that helps. Amazing. Amazing. Kubi, we've got another question from Anna, and this is both her comment and her question. She says, hi, Kubi. Thanks for your time today. I found it incredibly insightful. I'm interested to understand any pointers you have to help support changing people's opinion of you and your brand. Primarily senior leaders, as someone who is like Marmite, it's a skill I need to look to improve on. Mm. Well, firstly, thank you for your honest question um, and thank you for your compliment. Um, Anna, I would say that, um, I would always at this time of year um, challenge people to take a personal brand audit, to analyze what is it about your skills, your abilities, your character, uh, your capabilities that need to be, and your personality that need to be improved upon in order for you to be most effective in the workplace. So that's the first thing, to do a bit of a brand audit. And to not do an audit because you want your bosses to like you or you want your senior members of teams to like you, but to do an audit with the lens of how do I act as a team member that is here to serve the team better. Remember, I was saying at the top that personal branding is about servant, servant based leadership. It is not about promotion. It's about how you could be of benefit to your teams, to your organization, to the tribe that you serve, the tribe that you work in. And so when you do that audit, Anna, and you go through the lens of how can I be of better service, what you will come up with is ways to act, behave, and get results in a different way. When you show up as that version of you, your senior managers by default will recognize that there's a different Anna that's come into the marketplace. And when they recognize that a different Anna has come into the marketplace and you're consistent with being that person who's showing up to add value as opposed to the person who's showing up um, that's not adding enough value, when you do that consistently, if they recognize you, then they, the dynamic will change. If they do not recognize it and the dynamic doesn't change, then it might not be the right place for you. And so sometimes, I, I encourage people as they're developing their careers and they're building out their careers is to really think about your own personal brand values and where do you add the most value? What sort of organization can you shine and show up and be the best version of you adding the most value to that organization? Because the organization is going to get the best out of you and you're going to be the most happiest. Um, but it starts, first of all, by doing a personal brand audit. 
Amazing. And that's a really great note to end on. We've had one comment from just coming from Shazine who said, thank you so much. Very insightful and thoughtful responses with takeaway items that we can implement immediately. And that's really the point of today. You know, whenever QB teaches, I love listening to her speak because she always gives actionable tips. This is not just something to listen to, but it's something that each and every one can use and implement immediately after the session. So QB, thank you so much for your time today. Um, final question, where can people find you? If they want to reach out to you, if they want to get the book, how can people contact you directly? Oh, absolutely. So um, my website is kubispringer.com. So that's K-U-B-I s-p-r-i-n-g-e-r dot com kubispringer.com that's my personal brand website uh, and so you can um, discover about the books that I've written there crisis made my brand being the most recent one I am my brand being my first published book um, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn it's Kubi Springer on Twitter it's Kubi Springer uh, and then my agency uh, where we support corporates um, in developing out their uh, individuals personal brands so they can be better ambassadors for the organization at large the agency is called she builds brands and the website for that is shebuildsbrands.com and you can discover us on instagram she builds brands on linkedin she builds brands wonderful amazing qb i'm gonna give you a big round of applause that was Thank amazing you. thanks everybody for your time today we do appreciate that it's a tuesday afternoon and there's a million and one things that you could be doing so thanks a lot for your time everybody and have a great rest of the day Bye. Bye.